We will not be mentoring the platform formerly known as Twitter. I've had enough. Nobody in your church cares. So we didn't talk about this before we sat down to record. What is wrong in my life? Well, hey there and welcome to the Pro Church Tool Show. We're here to help you and your church navigate the biggest communication shift in 500 years. I'm Brady Shear, your host. I'm joined as always by my co-host. We call him Alexander Mills. Hey, Barbie. Hello, hello. <laughs> We've got, you're supposed to say, hey, Ken. <laughs> yeah. I, you threw me off because you said Alexander Mills. I'm like, what's happening? But yes. Hey, Ken. Hey, Ken. Hey, Barbie. We've got four great questions from the people of Pro Church Nation today. If you want your question answered, send us a text to 1-800-485-3139. But before we get to any of the questions, we have to announce the winners yes. of the Pro Church Tool Summer Giveaway. Not just one, but three winners. That's correct. And our first winner of the DJI Mini Drone. Grand prize. $750 value free Nucleus Universe and $500 of Nucleus Credit is Nathan at United Japanese Christian Church. Second winner of $749 value, Nucleus Universe, $500 of credit on their Nucleus account, Adrian, lead pastor of a new church plant in Las Vegas. Cool. And then finally, $500 of credit on their Nucleus account, Holly from First Baptist Church. Wow. I have reached out to all three of you, so make sure to get back to me to claim your prizes if you have not yet already. And congrats to everyone that won, and thank you to mm -hmm. everyone that entered. We're so glad to launch this uh, video version of the podcast uh, every week I'm still getting emails. Alex, it's so great. It's so good. He, he's back. <laughs> Man, did you like, did he get fired? <laughs> but then you like needed him. And I was like, <sighs> so I, I've, I've received two comments. Is that Alexander Mills coffee expert? Oh geez. It's like, yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah. Dang, you perceive me. Yeah. Uh, honestly, the intersection of, of worlds happening on the internet. And we're going to talk about it later when we talk, I'm going to mention threads uh, for a moment. Uh, but yeah, the intersections of our worlds on the internet between work and personal life and church and coffee, it's a lot, but it's good. We will not be mentoring the platform formerly known as Twitter. I've had enough. I got nothing to say. <laughs> okay. I, I cannot. <laughs> I will not. And we record these a week ahead. So who knows? Honestly, who knows what has transpired in the, in the last week? Oh my God. <laughs> I, I follow uh, a friend who, on Twitter, formerly Twitter, who, who took a month-long Twitter sabbatical and he, he logs back on today. He's like, what's up? What's happened? And it's like, I'll, I'm not sure if more could have happened while you were gone. But Yeah, this first question has nothing to do with Twitter or um, whatever permutation of, of formerly Twitter. We're on this first question on today's show. What are the most common mistakes to avoid when considering website design? We are a small congregation, average attendance around 100 people, and we cannot afford full-time tech people. So I've got seven mistakes here. In the context of this person and this church's question, average attendance 100, and we cannot afford full-time tech people. To me, the first two mistakes would be choosing a website builder that will be confusing or frustrating mm -hmm. for your existing team to manage. And as an extension to that, the second mistake would be choosing a website builder that above all else emphasizes flexibility. Now, what I mean by that is that when you're building a website builder, you are, as the creator of it, making decisions on what you want to deliver to the people that use the platform, mm -hmm. and you're always balancing these decisions. So on the one end of the spectrum, you would have very severe uh, limitations on flexibility, but the trade-off would be any person could use it, sure. and you would almost certainly always create beautiful web design. Mm -hmm. People could get frustrated on that extreme side of the spectrum, where they'd be like, I, I just want to be able to do more. Can I do this? Like, well, no, we can't do this. Well, why, why, why haven't you built that feature? Well, it's kind of hard to explain, but the reason that feature does not exist is because if it existed, it would create all of these potential uh, variable outcomes sure. to which you could take advantage of and then create something that doesn't look so great. And if we're trying to create a website builder for a church of 100 that does not have too much expertise in web a website design but has to do it themselves, then we want to limit their ability uh, because a, a complete blank canvas would not serve them well. On the other end of the spectrum, you have something like WordPress. Sure. You can do anything. Literally anything. Anything you want. Yeah. In your efforts to do that, you will almost certainly break things. Mm -hmm. You will create things that don't look good. You will create things that don't work well and don't serve your church well. Mm -hmm. And so maybe like both ends of the extreme are probably not useful for a church. It sounds like for this church, they'd want to be on the side of the spectrum that's closer to limited options, but 
with a greater predictable outcome that they're going to have something that's great. Sure, and especially in a in a smaller church like this, uh, average attendance around 100 people. It's similar size to my church. And to the questioner, this I know it feels like a small church, but that's a that's a pretty large church. That's bigger than the average church size in North America right now. Um, but I do know in churches that size that experience with building websites, especially like custom websites or building with WordPress, is surely limited. And maybe time as a resource and money as a resource is also limited. So it's possible that you're giving the responsibility to build this website to a volunteer or someone who is new to building church websites. And so like you said, Braid, for a church like this, which is most, a church of this size is most, like most churches in the world, uh, especially in North America, um, a church website builder that leans to the one side of the spectrum, which is the other side, of, the opposite side of the spectrum of WordPress is likely going to make this job easier for whoever gets the job and result in a better church website for your church. So we obviously have our own church website builder. It's called Nucleus, the premium church website builder for small and mid-sized churches. And so this question is, is very important to me because we build Nucleus exactly for this kind of church. And one of the principles of Nucleus that we talk about with the churches that use our platform, but we talk about internally with our team is we want you to feel like you can create with confidence, mm -hmm. meaning you can get into the website builder as someone that has no experience in this world and, and create something and then feel like, hey, I was able to make something good. Now that necessitates limiting some features. We just released the new version of Nucleus and it is tremendously more robust than the previous version mm -hmm. of Nucleus. And so we're kind of like pushing the boundaries ourselves of like, okay, we wanna give churches more options, but we don't want to give them so many options, complete flexibility. Now that being said, we also have like embed sections and custom code. And so there are some folks in the Nucleus uh, family of users that really go all out mm -hmm. and create things that's best because they know a lot more yeah. uh, than I do for sure yeah. <laughs> of creating custom, custom outcomes with their website. So that kind of talks about like choosing your website builder. Let's talk about the design of the site itself now. So mistake number three would be putting an emphasis on presentation instead of invitation. Mm -hmm. We say that there is this great uh, problem with churches, to, uh, church websites today called slideshow syndrome. And slideshow syndrome is essentially where a church website ends up being this extended presentation about the church, yeah. you know, where you kind of like, you go over to your, your grandparents' house and they went on a trip and they, they, they sit you down and, hey, let's go through a slideshow of our photos from this trip. And it just goes on and on and on. And, and, and church websites are like that. Like, here's who we are. Here's what we do. Here's where we're from. Here's what we're going. It's all about, it's all about us. Mm. And it's information focused, but there's nothing that's inviting people that are potentially checking out the church into involvement, into planning a visit, into making connections with the church. And then for the existing congregation, what invitations are being made to invite them mm -hmm. into taking their next step and being more uh, active participants uh, mistake number four, no primary focal point. This is a really simple one. I see this all the time. You land on a church's website. There's a section called above the fold. This is what you see on a website, on your device, everything before you start scrolling. In that moment, there should be one thing that draws the eye mm. of every visitor. Typically, that's going to be a big headline that is explaining why your church is, uh, <laughs> it matters to the yeah. world. And I, I, it, it's crazy how many times I'll land on a site and there will be like multiple things that are trying to vie for my attention. Yeah. And, and you really don't want that. Uh, you want a single, singular, for a primary focal point. And one, you know, there are more things that your church website can talk about. That's when you start scrolling. You can see more from there. I mean, that mistake is not having a primary focal point is related to the, the third mistake, which is emphasizing presenta presentation over invitation because churches emphasize emphasize presentation to a point that in that above the fold section, they just, they're throwing up a slider that's like swiping images so quickly. And it's like, when I land on the website, the first thing I saw is already gone three seconds later. And so those two mistakes are related there. And so having one image, one headline, one looping background video there is, is can really solve that problem of causing some sort of like disorientation when visitors land on your church website for the first time. You can still have your logo, you can still have your navigation menu, obviously, yeah. but the easiest formula for this that works for virtually every organization, every church in the world, is some type of background visual, a single headline, and a single call to action mm -hmm. button. Can't go wrong. Mistake number five, it's 
Difficult to find the church's address or service times. The worst. You would be surprised at how frequently this happens. One of the easiest solutions is to put both into your footer. Mm -hmm. Your footer is going to be on every page of the site. At the bottom, if your address and service times are a part of that footer, you can rest assured that every single page of your site has uh, those details that a lot of the time people are just checking out your church. They already yeah. know they're coming. Okay, I, I, where is this address? Mm -hmm. And what time, what time is service mm -hmm. again? And, and they can't find it. Sometimes when you change service times, your existing church who's been there, they, they need to check yeah, that out. Yeah. Mistake number six, not having a beliefs page or a staff page. These are kind of the two pages on a website that are most frequently overlooked and forgotten. Uh, sometimes churches, I find, they don't, think that like, they don't want to seem like they're talking about themselves mm. so much. Uh, and, and we've already alluded to that in respect to like, you don't want it to be slideshow syndrome and, and it's all about presentation. There are two non-negotiables here, which are your beliefs and your staff. Mm -hmm. And we say that church is family, church is a community of believers. Well, it's imperative then when you are evaluating a church and considering, hey, yeah. am I going to yeah. plan a visit for my family? It, who are the people that are leading this group of people yeah. and community what of they believers? Believe? Yeah. And then exactly, an extension of that is like, okay, and what are the, the, the things that this church believes? What are their unique expressions of faith? You know, every church has different emphases and things that they mm -hmm. value and their DNA and identity. Like, what is that? So making sure you have both of those pages. And then mistake number seven, this is kind of just a general uh, teaching point on church website design. Your church's website needs three things. It needs inspiration, information, and invitation. Mm. There really isn't anything that your church website needs that won't fit into one of those three categories. If your website is missing, largely absent one of those categories, that's a vulnerability. Mm. If one of them is like tremendously uh, full as a bucket and the other two are like really empty, uh, that's also not good. You kind of want an equal balance of all three. And then it really just comes down to how are you organizing and sorting yeah. those three buckets? And there's a lot of... Uh, freedom that comes with that, kind of personal preference. But broadly speaking, you want inspiration to come first, you want information to come second, and then you want inv invitation to come third. Uh, so like that on a homepage, that might look like first section on the homepage is background image, headline, call to action button. The second section might be an about us section. Mm -hmm. And then there is, you know, the launcher by Nucleus that's installed and there's a little widget in the bottom right corner and the most important next steps for your church are kind of in there. And that's kind of like a really rough sequence order of events, uh, putting these kind of in an order. The order isn't too important. Those are the three buckets that exist. You need kind of all three in equal measure. Yeah. We got a handful of common mistakes that we see in church websites and regardless of what church website builder our listeners or viewers are using right now, you could probably go through your site this week keep an eye out for any of these mistakes, patch them up real quick, and uh, your website will be a more effective ministry tool uh, if you fix those mistakes. Okay, Braid, question two. What are your top three leadership tips? Okay, so I was thinking about this this morning, you know, leading a team of roughly 30 at this point, starting with zero, kind of just leading myself. And so uh, in no particular order, the first one is don't take yourself too seriously. When you're leading uh, any group of people, whether it is yourself or 30 or 300, whatever it might be, there are going to be moments of conflict. There are going to be moments of tension. And I think the leaders that struggle the most with this are the ones that have the biggest ego mm. and the ones that really take themselves so seriously because they think that they are all that. And look, if you are a leader, if you are someone that's doing something that you, know, you feel like truly matters, you have to have a certain belief in yourself. Mm -hmm. And as an entrepreneur on this side of things, I always say like, you have to have a little bit of like self delusion to think that you can like do something <laughs> that most people would never yeah. consider trying. So you have to be like a little delusional, but at the same point, you can't take yourself so seriously mm -hmm. that when you're having personal conflict with somebody else, that you can't get past your own ego. Mm. And this probably doesn't pr like crop up at the beginning of most things, right? Like there's always that honeymoon period for virtually anything. And so even when you're in a new church, you know, you might have like two, three years mm. where things are pretty good because it's just like, it's new and you've got all these exciting things happening and it's fresh. And then eventually that freshness wears off and maybe you have your first kind of bigger conflict mm -hmm. with your senior leader, or you have one of your first bigger conflicts with a, a, a parishioner in your church sure. or someone below you on the leadership hierarchy in your ministry. And suddenly now, this is when you're really put to the test. And so I, I always try to remind myself, like, okay, don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, you have to be, you know, 
working this out with this person to uh, provide for long-term uh, success in the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing is to make values-based decisions. So we, we hear this from a lot. I've been looking through all the questions we got during this, uh, during this kind of contest period, and a lot of people just asking the question like, how, how do I get my pastor to like see the value in X? Yeah. Or like, wh wh why, what do you do when a pastor like just keeps doing Y? Mm. And my best guess is that for those that are a little bit confounded by their senior leader's decision making, that stems from them not seeing what are the values that are inspiring this decision. Mm. And things go really smoothly in a church when the mission is clear, the mission is articulated and understood by both the staff, the leadership, and the congregation. And then decisions can be tied back to those values and that mission. We spent money in this way because this is our mission, and we believe that the best way to fulfill that mission is to make a decision in this way. Mm -hmm. When you make a values-based decision, people may disagree with how you arrived at that, but they, they understand your line of reasoning. And if you're trying to build a culture, if you're trying to like, you know, bring a group of people in a certain way, and look, leading a church is difficult because basically every single week you arrive and you say to people, look, you need to die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're like, well, I'd prefer not to. And you say, well, unfortunately, this book says we must. Yeah. The Lord Jesus says we must. And so if you want to do something that is that uh, difficult, frankly, right? Like the Bible talks about how difficult it is, you know, the straight and narrow path, mm -hmm. um, the narrow path. If it was wide, it would be easy. Uh, you need to be able to make values-based decisions, communicate that, and then at the very least, you have your church and the rest of your staff being like, okay, I don't know if this is going to work out, but this is who we say we are. We made the decision based on that, and I can understand that. I can speak to the benefit of that a little bit. The last few years here at Pro Church Tools, we've done a lot of growing as a company in so many different ways. Um, we've taken on some big projects. We've made a lot of new decisions. We've forged some new paths. And for our team, we you actually uh, took the initiative to do this was to, and we knew we had a value system, but to write them out, itemize them. And we all have a copy in our desk so that when we are forging these new paths in our in our company and our, our office and our, our products that we make and such, and we're making decisions that we haven't made before, we can hold that up against our value system and see the congruency and also see that if we're making a decision or talking about something that doesn't align with these values, it feels discongruent, um, then we can see why we wouldn't make that decision, why we wouldn't go down that path. And so for us as, as a group here, it's been really helpful to have those values itemized and like physically printed so we have them at the ready when we need to navigate some stuff. It's been really helpful for us. Yeah, and as you say that, it makes me think I should probably like revisit those. You know, it's always worth like just rereading sure. them. I haven't read them in like a few months. And so you know, making sure that I'm anchored in those values as well. Oh, we did, uh, Rebecca and I, we just had our anniversary last week. That reminds me. Because uh, we, we do that every year. We read our vows to each other on our anniversary every year, every year as kind of like a recentering of like, okay, hmm. seven years ago we made these promises. What, how are we living up to those things? And revisiting them and reminding ourselves. So it, practically this works out for you in a church um, by doing this annually or semi-annually, just going over the values again or revisiting some and say, hey, our community, our, the shape of our community has changed. Should we revisit this value and add some new language or what have you? Um, and for us as a married couple, that's been really helpful over the years just to um, anchor ourselves again to that North Star, remind ourselves of some things, reaffirm some things and keep moving forward because those, those vows serve as uh, an affirmation of the values we have as, as people, as a married couple. Um, so yeah, really helpful in all sorts of relationships. So my first leadership tip, don't take yourself too seriously. Mm. The second, make values based decisions. And the third, take care of yourself. Mm. Again, probably not something that like in the first few years of whatever new leadership position that you're in, you're thinking about. And then the longer that you go at it, if you truly want to give your best week in and week out, mm -hmm. month in, month out, year in and year out, you have to prioritize your own health. Yeah. This means your physical health in terms of the food and drink that you're putting in your body, the amount of sleep that you're getting, the amount of movement that you're getting. It means your emotional health and the relationships that you're in and doing your very best to uh, minimize stress, minimize anxiety, uh, minimize uh, burdens that you're carrying that Jesus doesn't want you to mm -hmm. carry. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, of course, your spiritual health. And this means being anchored to the creator, the one that inspires and, you know, gives breath to every single thing that you want to do in the world of mm -hmm. ministry. 
These are the types of things. The reason these tips are so important to me is because the longer that I've been in a position of leadership, roughly 10 years now, my entire adult life, the longer that I've been in it, the more that I realize a lot of times you want to take like a step forward or two steps forward, but you cannot take infinitely steps forward. Mm -hmm. You have to pause at certain points along the journey. You have to take steps back at certain points along the journey so that you can continue mm. uh, the journey. We were talking in last week's episode or previous episode about pastors taking days off. Yeah. And I got a DM from an old friend of mine who uh, is a pastor's kid. He's uh, maybe a decade older than I am, five years older than I am. And he was talking about in the seasons of growth at his church that he lived through many, he always remembers the work ethic of the pastors mm. and how much dedication they put in. And he said there were also pastors that we had that were very much like they were just fine to kind of like collect the paycheck and 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 do the job, but you know, not with great, uh, <laughs> not with great fervor, mm. let's say. And and his point was like like to do anything good, you have to like go all out. And what I said, and I'm not sure if I was pushing back or just making sure I was clarifying what I believed. I was like, I also know that to build something and to do something great, you have to work extremely hard. But the working hard can take place over 10 years instead of one. Mm -hmm. And I have this quote on my chalkboard wall in my office that says, uh, it's very easy to overestimate what we can accomplish in one year and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10 years. Yeah. And what we see with people burning out is, you know, Icarus flying too close to the sun, the, you know, the match that burns too bright, it extinguishes faster. And so you kind of have to like get as close as you can to going all out with enough margin that you're not overextending yourself so that you can go out, go all out for like, like let's say you can go 80% all out for 10 years or you can go 100% all out for three. Let me give you a really nerdy <laughs> analogy for okay. this, okay? So uh, one of my favorite books that I read this year was Peter Atiyah's Outlive. And in that book, he talks about the mitochondria, which are kind of like this powerhouse of the cell that exists in the human body. And the mitochondria, what they do is they basically take uh, glucose and the food that you intake, and they turn it into ATP or energy that your body can use to do things. Mm -hmm. And he says, one of the hallmarks of longevity, not meaning how long you live, but how well you live for whatever many years you get, mm -hmm. is training these mitochondria to be as, uh, you know, powerful as they can be. That's one of the, you know, hallmarks of, you know, the final decade of your life being a healthy, a healthy one and not right. one that most of us experience right now, which is, you know, quite, quite sad mm -hmm. and lonely and ouchy. So he says, what we want to do is we want to train the mitochondria. And he says, the way to do this is what is called zone two cardio. And zone two cardio is like not, um, this is not zone two like you would see on your treadmill. Have you ever been on a treadmill? It's like zone two, heartbeat mm -hmm. related. It's not heart rate related. In fact, one of the only ways to properly measure it is through uh, a lactate meter. And what happens is as you are doing any type of exercise, your body is producing lactate. And there is a certain uh, level of lactate in your cell or in your blood, pardon me, that when you exceed that level, you're no longer working out your mitochondria. Your mitochondria has kind of exceeded its capacity and you start kind of going into other mm -hmm. stores of your body to get the energy that you need. And so what you can do is you can actually get this lactate meter, spoiler alert, I got one, mm -hmm. and you can do a certain exercise and then you can prick your finger with a lancet test the blood, and you can see where your lactate is okay. in your blood to confirm if you're working too hard mm -hmm. or if you're right in that sweet spot. And for those that care, it's like 1.7 um, mi minimal per liter of blood to like 1.9. You don't okay. want to exceed two. Nothing I say here should be taken as any type <laughs> of, <laughs> please, do not, this is my very basic understanding of how it works. The point is, there's this level where if you work too hard, you're defeating the purpose of like what you're trying to train. Right, right. And so you're actually purposefully limiting your effort so that you can like train this thing because it has this limited capacity. The great paradox is that the more you train it and don't exceed its capacity, the greater its mm. capacity grows. But if you go too hard too fast, yeah. you're just defeating the whole purpose at all. An imperfect analogy, but any reason for me to talk about the no, nerdy new lactate device that I uh, you know acquired and it I'm works. excited to use. Point being, Kind of stay in that zone where you can go all out, but with enough margin that you can go all out sustainably. Mm -hmm. You know, we say this with churches on social media all the time. Post as much as you can in a sustainable rhythm. Mm -hmm. 
You could probably post every day this week, but could you post every day this week and for the next 100 weeks? Right. Maybe not. What if you posted every other day? Could you do that for the next 100 weeks? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. Whatever that uh, limit is where you could post that frequently for the next 100 weeks, stick to that. Mm -hmm. Because the greatest success on social, in life, in your mitochondria, <laughs> is finding that sustainable pace and then sticking to it for the long term. And it's so good because we've actually been, I've noticed this thread through the last handful of shows questions that are coming in that are talking about um, health and energy and work in some way, whether it's um, rest or Sabbath or burnout or what have you. And we're talking about it again. And this this time in the context of leadership. And the question comes from someone asking how to be a better leader. And that infers that they're leading people. They're, they have a team or or they're, they're leading people. And to be healthy, to, to your point here, this is your, your third tip, take care of yourself. As a leader, it's imperative because the folks that you're leading, the team that you're leading, the church that you're leading are going to mirror your leadership. And so as you take care of yourself, the people that you're leading are going to take care of themselves as well. And to your body analogy or to the body analogy that we find in the scriptures, um, you will then work as a, a much more functional, cohesive, healthy, collaborative body as a team if you as the leader or the proverbial head in this in this case, mirror what it looks like to live and work in, uh, in a state, in a posture of health, uh, your, your team will go so much further and for so much longer than, than they ever could if, you're, if you are exhibiting a way of living that isn't taking care of yourself, your team is just gonna mirror that right back to you. Absolutely. Next question. Hey, Brayden. Mm. I took over the comms for our church. What is your advice or strategy for a church rolling out a new sermon series? Three weeks out? Two weeks out? One week? The week of? I always like to respond to this question by first reminding all of us creatives <laughs> that relative to your personal and creative investment mm -hmm. in a sermon series and its artwork and its name and its uh, structure, how long it's running, mm -hmm. and the soundtrack that you chose and the color palette and the font... Nobody in your church cares. <laughs> it's, it's an unfortunate truth. And it is unfortunate because if I came out with like new branding for something and you were in our audience, you would care way more about that than someone in your church cares about your new sermon series name and it's like creativity and all that. Mm -hmm. And the re why? Not because what we're doing is any is superior to yours. It's just that our audience is full of creative people mm -hmm. who kind of like geek out on that. And your church is full of uh, likely uh, regular folks and some care about that, but not too many. Mm -hmm. And so I always just want to lower people's like expectations and standards because what we typically see is churches being like, you know, it's, I always have the same notes. Our new sermon series, Grave, Grave Digger, Digger. Yeah. coming <laughs> soon. And, and it was, why, why don't they care? Grave Digger, look at this design. It's like, I, but this, it just doesn't mean anything to folks on its own. So with that being said, I don't think there's a huge burden that you need to do a ton of yeah. promotion because here's the other thing. Presumably you have a sermon series going on right now. And right. there's a there's a trailer for it. Yeah, it's like don't worry about don't it. worry about this one. Four weeks from now, you're gonna want to come see Grave Digger. Yeah, it's not it's not like movie trailers, <laughs> yeah. right? You're not like sitting down for the feature presentation and then run like in December we'll be doing this, and in and in the summer it's at the movies, and and then Grave Digger Back from the Dead yeah, the sequel nice. is next Easter. <laughs> and it doesn't work like that. So I think you can basically do it. The best I've seen this done is at the final week of the kind of concluding sermon series, the pastor will do a pretty good job of working into this message, kind of previews for where mm -hmm. the next series is coming from. Because at its best, sermon series are not necessarily like in a vacuum, these isolated things. Sometimes they are and sometimes they have to be. But often when you're planning a preaching calendar, there's kind of like, okay, this season is this way. And we're going to talk about this because it aligns with the rhythms and the seasons of like our church and the world. And then mm -hmm. we're going to kind of dovetail into this and then that'll lead into this. And there's some type of kind of plot, a line that you can draw. So a pastor that has that top of mind, and typically they do because they're the ones that planned out mm -hmm. the preaching calendar at the conclusion of a series, they can begin to kind of tease. And, and, and next week we're going to take this and we're going to, in our new series, Grave Digger, we're going to talk about this a bit more. And so that's kind of the best way to do it. Though I have a novel idea. I think, you know, the whole end credits world, no end credit scene in Oppenheimer, okay. no end credit scene in Barbie. Wow. So I think 
The Mar- movie was three hours long and you sat there through the credits to see if there was a scene? No, no, I did the whole Google, is there an end credit scene and walked <laughs> nice. out, which unfortunately has become like a habit of mine yeah. that I have to do at every movie. Yeah. So I think like, you know, Marvel popularized this. Let's bring it to the church world, mm-hmm. okay? Service ends and like you obviously have, many churches have, if you're following like the legal copyright, like maybe you have a screen that says like the copyright notices for all the songs mm-hmm. that you use, you know, so certain like CSL, those are like the end credits of a movie, okay. right? And then you have those up for a couple seconds and then the whole room goes black, mm-hmm. okay? And then just onto the screen walks like a guest speaker. And you're like, he's back, oh no, oh my gosh, the pastor from across the we town. We thought he was dead. He's a grave digger. <laughs> Okay, okay. So okay. end credits, but promoting the next series. Um, you know, this is the, you know, like, oh, Iron Man will return. Yeah. Grave Digger will return. Pastor Mike from First Baptist yeah. across the street will return. Yeah. Just, not, an, just an idea. Not something, a bad idea. Something to consider. Speaking of uh, end credit scenes, you remember hidden tracks on CDs? Oh, yeah. Like you get to the end of track 12 and then just like eight minutes of, of silence. silence. Like Five Iron Frenzy was popular I mean, yeah, for this. I mean, yeah, they did that one. Yeah. And then, and, and back to, to your point about Googling to see if there's a scene, it's like, are you going to sit through the silence or are you going to fast forward and skip to the hidden track? There's wow. some, some good hidden tracks there. Hidden tracks. Bring back hidden tracks. How? I mean, same way, just like 13th song on the new, I don't know, Post Malone record or whatever. And after the three minute song is over, there the song continues, eight minutes of silence, and then just comes in with But you wouldn't even fast forward, you would just like drag it. It yeah. was just it's not poor Posty. He uh-huh. announces his release date like two months ago, and then Travis Scott is like, yeah. Utopia is finally here. Yeah. Same day. Dang. How about Post Malone with a verse on that Noah Khan song? Yeah, that was interesting. That was awesome. I can't stop singing that song. And Rebecca, because it's a song about about being drunk and making mistakes while you're drunk, but it's just very catchy. Uh-huh. Rebecca and I were making a play set for our son last night and I'm, mm. I'm like singing the hook to the song. She's like, what are you, she's not on TikTok anymore. She's like, what are you singing? I'm like, you know what, don't worry about it. I'm not a country <laughs> listener, but sometimes I'll just be like, yes. last night we <laughs> yeah. let the liquor talk. I was like, no, you didn't. <laughs> what are you talking about? I know, I know. If Utopia or Austin didn't drop, by the way, and you're, cause again, now we're <laughs> right. recording yes. a week above. Like, no, he delayed the album. I, I should have known. I yeah. apologize. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? Maybe there's a hidden track on the post on the post record, and we just didn't know. Now, the first, the lead single by Travis, where he links up with the weekend and uh, and at Bad Bunny. I understand why you do that because it's like you know, that's like uh, the Elephant Room where it was like James McDonald, Driscoll, yes. Ferg. It's like got the <laughs> biggest names back in the day together. I'm just like Travis. What do you no? That's not anyway. You've yeah. lost the plot. It's been eight years since your last album. Well, hopefully that album did drop. Okay, and something didn't go wrong there. Before our fourth and final question, mm. the question that returns, much like Grave Digger keeps coming back around mm. today on the show, Braid, what's wrong lately? Yeah, everyone's favorite segment. Yeah. So I got two, and there's a common theme with these two, what's wrong lately? <laughs> <laughs> the segment where we talk about things that are just not as they should be. Right. Nothing too serious. No, no, Not no. too dark. Yeah, because okay? there, there's a lot of that stuff. We don't need to talk about yeah. that. This is more like the annoying things. Yeah. Like I have this thing in my eye right now. I didn't write this down. It's just like a little twitchy. Every time you look up eye twitch, everyone's like, it's probably fine. Yeah. It's kind of annoying, though. It's, it's really... super annoying. Have you had this before? Have I you... have. When I don't get enough sleep, I uh-huh. get the eye twitch. He's kind of doing it right now. Yeah. But just like, you'd have to really zoom in. Yeah. Maybe I will. <laughs> yeah, maybe you will. Okay. So common theme between these two what's wrong lately items. Uh, these are real life examples of society just descending into dystopian madness. Mm. Okay. So the first was what I'm calling two-factor authentication in real life. This was crazy. So we had to get a new camera for the studio setup Mm -hmm. because the A1 kept overheating. Internet says it shouldn't. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. So we got the new Sony FX30, which is a great B cam to pair with our Sony FX3, which is a full frame. The FX30 is like the little brother, most of the same features, very, very similar body, but it's not a full frame camera, right. which is great for a side angle because we're kind of zoomed in here. The main angle needs the full frame. Exciting. Anyway, I buy it from Amazon because they had the fastest delivery mm-hmm. and we wanted to get this camera into the studio as fast as we could. It is now filming. I think it's filming your angle right now. Yeah. Okay. Praise God. So I get an email the day before delivery from Amazon saying, hey, your item should be delivered tomorrow. Please provide the code that we will be sending you to the courier when they arrive at your door. In real life. Yeah. Yeah. I had not received the code yet. So the day of, 
I receive a code. And I was wondering, like, is this going to be like a fun password? You know, like bananas. Yes. <laughs> no, it was like 908365. Did a six-digit uh, code. Uh, time limit expiration? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every 30 seconds, the yeah. Authenticator app would refresh. No, no, it was one code. So the guy comes to the door, and I was interested, how is this, how is this interaction going to go? Mm -hmm. Like, I've... He I've, just stares at you blankly until you give him the right, <laughs> the right numbers. I should not reveal this to anyone listening. Mm -hmm. I get so many deliveries to my house, and I had never once experienced this. Mm -hmm. This is brand new. And so I figured this isn't something that's happening a lot just yet. Is this courier going to be like, make a joke about it? Are they going to be like, hey, did you get the code? Like, what are the chances that, I would, I would imagine most of the time they are asking for the code, the person looks at them like, uh, right. what? what? And this is obviously as a substitute for signatures at the mm -hmm. door, which remarkably have kept society afloat for a century. I don't understand which why. Which is ridiculous because they're fake. Like when we get deliveries here, they're usually in your name. The guy opens the door. He asked me what my name is. I tell him, ask for a signature. I draw one squiggly line and then he's gone. He's like, thanks. What, what kind of, what type of authentication was that? So granted, this is obviously more secure and I, I applaud Amazon for, for sure. trailblazing a more secure uh, delivery system. It's a big system. purchase. You don't want them just leaving it on the doorstep for I uh, would have been fine. You know, an, an Amazon thief to come and grab? No one, no, you could leave it. That's fine. <laughs> um, but we know that two factor authentication in real life, online, pardon me, is just so important and the bane of all of our existences. Yes. So he comes to the door. And I had just gotten the code and I texted it to my wife in case I didn't know when they were coming to deliver sure. it if I wasn't home. She comes to the, lo the, the door, says not a word, holds out his device just in my face. I enter the six digits. No way. Without a word, he hands me the camera and walks away. No way. Yeah. That's bizarre. I wonder, so this was going to be my question was because you have one of those doorbells with the, the two-way talking. So sometimes... Like, we'll be out to lunch or something. You'll get a package. Someone will be standing there. You'll get a notification on your, on your phone. Someone's at your door. And you'll just hop on the mic and be like, hey, you can just, you can leave it there. That's fine. I wonder if you weren't home. Ooh. Let's say you had, maybe you were in here. Maybe we were recording. And Brittany, uh, Sadie needs to go to the doctor. She takes Sadie to the, nobody's home. If the doorbell rings and you answer on the, on the little mic, could you have authenticated with the code verbally? We'll never know. Until next time, when we get the next FX30, I have to do it all over again. Yeah, because apparently this is a new thing now. Yeah. So I thought this was the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> so my wife and I, we uh, watch TV in bed like many couples. Uh, we like go to bed when our kids go to bed. Yeah. So uh, our, our youngest goes to bed at 7 o'clock, our eldest at 8 o'clock. As soon as the eldest goes to bed, oh one, yeah. straight in bed. Sometimes I go to bed before her. Mm -hmm. Like it's summertime, like, you good? She's like, yeah, I'm just playing over here. Cool. I'm like, all right, night, 7.30. I'm going to I'm bed. looking forward to that season of life. Praise God. Yeah. And so... Also, yeah, it's not like I'm going to go to bed any later, but yeah, yeah, that'll be nice when they can do bedtime on their own. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. that, yeah. It, it's still pretty unusual, sure. but it can happen, yeah. which is, you know, a nice break from routine. So my wife, she needs to watch, like, basically, like, background comfort shows. She's not so much watching them yeah. as they're just kind of, like, our accompaniment, and like she cannot watch shows that are at all like um, intense. Yeah. So what happens is we end up revisiting the same kind of sitcoms over and over mm -hmm. again. So it's The Office, and then it's Seinfeld. Those are kind of our two favorites. And we had kind of just done those so much that we were like, okay, what are we going to do? Do something different. Mm -hmm. So we went, oh, let's go back to Friends. You know, I watched Friends a ton as a kid. It doesn't hold up in the same way those other shows do, but it has a certain charm. So we're watching it, and we always watch TV with captions. Mm -hmm even when it's just running on in the background. Mm -hmm. So the iconic uh, Rembrandt's theme song hits, clap, 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 clap. And it says at the very beginning, and it comes up on the screen, uh, captions brought to you by Warner Brothers Studios. And I was like, oh, okay, so these are like captions from the actual studio instead sure. of auto captions. That's pretty cool. That is followed up by, sponsored by Ocean Breeze, Crave the Wave. What is happening? What platform is Friends on? I actually what? don't know. It's just on Apple TV. Okay. And I don't, I don't know if I bought it because it was on Netflix, but it left Netflix. Right. Like I just, I've just been watching. I don't know how yeah. I, how I have it. <laughs> so now we're selling sponsorship, sponsorship parts. Yeah. In 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 captions. Yeah, that's brutal. 
That's brutal. I haven't encountered that yet. Crave the wave. Yeah. Crave the wave. But you know what? Might Bri- be prime real estate for uh, the Pro Church Tools show. Maybe we should get in on <laughs> on uh, sponsoring some captions. You no, know, Britt said she's like, um, what is Ocean Breeze? And I was like, well, we're talking Let's about Let's find this out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um... <laughs> So we didn't talk about this before we sat down to record, but you mentioned right off the top of this show, you're like, we're not talking about Twitter. <laughs> but when I, when, I, when I was prepping for the podcast and I was reading what's wrong lately, I was sitting there thinking, you know what? What is wrong in my life? What is, what is proving to be a point of frustration in my life that mm. is not existential, not the worst thing in the world, but thing that's just like, man, this is frustrating. And it's Twitter <laughs> or the app that, we, that was formerly known as Twitter, now known as X, thanks to the man at the helm, Elon Musk. And it's, it's coming to the point, and we've talked about this on the show, about how the community that I've cultivated on Twitter, it's the social platform that I spend the most time on. The community that I've cultivated on Twitter with the people I follow is so dear to me. I get so much life, so much um, theological um, education and, and um, daily happenings, news and notes, and I get it all from Twitter because I've done the work to make this community. I follow 400 and so people. This tomfoolery that is unfolding on this app, and if you don't know, I shouldn't even explain it to you, but like overnight, Elon was like, it's not Twitter anymore. It's called X, and it's still hosted at twitter.com, but x.com forwards to twitter.com. The bird is gone. It's just an X, which I believe is just an X from some $30 font that he's kind of put up there. And did you see that he tried to take the Twitter... um, the Twitter name and logo down off the Twitter building in San Francisco and the fire department came and had to shut it down because he didn't get the permits to like do that kind of work in the middle of the street. Again, anyway, delusion, right? Yeah. We all have a bit of it. Some of us might have a bit too much. Yeah. So now you're caught up now and a week has elapsed since we've recorded and you're listening to it. So literally only God knows what could have happened between then and now, but it's pushing me to the point where it's like, I, I don't know what, the longevity of this social platform is going to be. So I'm reevaluating my relationship with threads and thinking, okay, I'm going to have to rebuild this audience on threads. And so this morning I was doing a Google search, import Twitter following list to threads to see if there was some kind of app or API where you they wish. could like pull my, my, the people I follow and auto follow them in threads, which of course there's You not. even Googling that might, have him showing up at your house. Yeah, but there is, you know what, there actually is a really helpful service for that, for importing a Spotify playlist into Apple Music. It's called like Tune My Music or something, and it does it flawlessly, because I'm an Apple Music listener. And every time you people have people here are Spotify users. Yeah. So if there's a playlist that's shared that I want, that website will do it for me. Okay. So I was hoping there was something like that for threads, no. So now I'm, I'm on the brink, on the precipice of deciding like, am I going to start rebuilding my community on threads? And I'm leaning, I'm leaning towards yes. And that feels really frustrating to me. Threads, when I refresh, like won't even refresh for me anymore. Really? The app is just like broken on my phone. And, um, they have a great logo though. They do have a nice comparatively logo. Comparatively to the former bird app. Yes. But the former bird apps logo is iconic. Iconic. And it might be perfect. Honestly, no notes. And then I just, did you? <laughs> <laughs> they were actually, because the night before he's like, he's so, <laughs> he's something else. He tweeted out, he's like, uh, if anyone can design me a great logo for X, I'll use it. And so people gave some really great entries, some of which were like a marriage between yes. the bird and the X. Again, perfect logos, no notes. Like embrace the X, but a, a little, a little uh, ode to the bird. It was great. No. I have two theories on this, <laughs> okay? And I don't know which one is right. Mm. They're both so uh, so extreme theories because I cannot come up with an easy way of understanding why these decisions are being made. Yeah. The first is that for someone that kind of, you know, brought electric vehicles into the mainstream consciousness and, and someone that is trying to like develop just like consumer rocket ships yeah. and, and perhaps, you know, colonize Mars. Like this is just such big brain thinking. Sure. He's so many steps ahead <laughs> yes. that I can't even really see where he's trying to bring us. Mm-hmm. 
And I think that's maybe the charitable reading of it. I also think that maybe if that is correct, the reality is sometimes it's almost like angel investing. You need to take big home run swings at every pitch. And, and a lot of the times you're going to fail. But the one that hits is going to disrupt for the positive or the negative the world in such a big way yeah. that it almost makes up for every other thing. And for someone that's made as big of a stride in certain industries and in business as this man has, that he only knows one way. And, and there is no asking for permission. There's just doing and we, look, we're going to put our head down and we are going to get this thing done. That's kind of like my, my charitable <laughs> reading. Now, what I would say is that, hey, one step ahead, you're a leader, two steps ahead, you're a martyr. And when you're trying to move a legacy brand, quote unquote, the way Twitter is, at least in the social media space, if you move too fast, too quickly, you may do irreparable damage where you can't really come out of that. Uh, also, you know, for my personal investment on this, I came on this uh, show like a fool and said threads has no hope and then every day since elon has been like i believe in disproving brady's <laughs> prediction and i'll do everything that i can to show him that yeah. the first time he ever made a social media prediction yeah <laughs> i'm going to you do said good. i'm happy to be proven wrong yeah the second theory is this right. <laughs> and this is the more insidious one the thing i actually think is maybe more likely and that is elon's comments publicly have become considerably more uh, right-wing in the last five years. Yeah. He was kind of like a darling of the left and of the tech industry for a long time. And to be clear, I own a Tesla. It is the best car I've ever owned. I have no notes on this car. It brings me great joy every day. And so I do kind of hold a little, uh, in, in, in at least like mainstream culture, it seems like you either like worship Elon or think he's the Antichrist. Sure. I, I don't think either of those are uh, Accurate, I'm kind of, for me, I'm kind of like, oh man, sometimes, why does he do this? Other times I'm like, hey, you built this thing I'm really happy yeah. about. So, or at least he gets credit for building it. Yeah. <laughs> so my thought is maybe as a billionaire, as one of the most wealthy persons on earth, he saw in recent years how platforms like Twitter have removed gatekeeping and kind of like gathered people to, to give more power to people where they could initiate certain cultural changes, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. Mm. And this type of revolutionary attitude and power he saw in some ways as a threat, mm. right? Like you see his discourse changing to all, very more to, to right wing. We're coming out of a pandemic. A lot of people didn't like how that was, uh, that was handled. And so my, my 4D big brain chess theory mm -hmm. is that he saw this powerful platform as something that was a threat to him and other people like him. He's like, look, for the greater good of society, I have to purchase this because I can. Right. And basically just dismantle it through a series of steps and actions that people will be like, why is he doing this? Yeah, because I don't care. I'm trying to disrupt it. I'm trying to mm. break away it, its power so that what I'm trying to accomplish will no longer be threatened by this. It is the public version of paying off somebody. Right, <laughs> You're right. just going to pay off the platform, buy it, and then just like strip it for parts. I hope it's not that one. His decisions are so mind-boggling that I'm like tinfoil hat Brady now. I know. I guess only time will tell. In the meantime, you can follow me on threads. Uh, you can follow me on threads, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm there. Yeah. And all six of you that like my content because nobody cares about threads. Yeah. But, I'll, I, hey, I'm still posting. I'm, I'm glad to be proven wrong. I am platform agnostic. I okay. do not, unlike Elon, have any horses in this race. Uh, where the attention is, I will follow. There you go. Okay, the next thing that's wrong is actually a callback to, um, I think the last time we answered this question, uh, my phone, we've talked about this, the back oh, of my yeah. phone is broken. I've been struggling to find uh, time to take it to the Apple store, be without it for the afternoon or the day or whatever, get it back. Um, someone who listened to the show wrote in and said, hey, uh, Apple does express replacement. So you can actually just call them, they will set it up, they will ship you a device, you just throw your SIM card in, you ship your broken one back, they'll fix it in three to five business days, return it, you return the lended device, no downtime, you didn't even have to leave your house. So yesterday, um, I got online with Apple, and man, they make it so easy. Like every customer experience, or customer support experience I've had with them has just been flawless. I open a chat, it pops up like an iMessage window, it's got the iMessage sounds, I'm chatting back and forth with Phoebe, she's super helpful. And she's like, yep, your Apple Care Plus plan covers this, mm. uh, express replace, replacement. I'm gonna send you the secure 
um, link to for the payment. So pay for the repair, which should have been like 39 bucks for the back screen. And then you have to put a hold down on the price of the phone that they're gonna send you. So, so, so it's not included? It's covered, but you it's not free. For accidental damage, you have to pay like a small amount to get the repair done. So for the back screen, it should be 39 bucks. Oh, typically that would be many hundreds if you yeah, didn't have? Yeah, exactly. I understand. Um, so Love when you pay for insurance so that you have the opportunity to pay that's for right. a fix. So you gotta put a hold down on your credit card for the device they're gonna send you. I'm like, yeah, that totally makes sense. So she says, anything else? I said, no, that's great. She closes the chat, can't reopen the chat. So I get the email and there's a few charges in there that I, I couldn't make sense of. So I'm like, oh, I gotta go back and open the chat, ask her some questions, can't open the chat. So go back through the same avenue to open up a new chat. Can't do that because I just had a chat open. They are not letting me open a chat, but they're like, but you can call us. I'm like, no, that's fine. So I go to call, they call right away, it's great. I get the guy on the phone, I'm like, hey, can you make sense of some of these charges for me? Again, super helpful, so nice. And he's like, yeah, so the express, when you do an express replacement, they actually don't fix the phone on some of the devices. This is a 12 Pro Max. He says, they're not gonna fix your phone, they're just gonna replace it. So the $129 fee you're seeing on your thing that you can't make sense of, it if you bring it to a store, it's 39 bucks because they'll fix the back. If you do the express replacement, it's $129 because they're just gonna send you a new phone. So all of, all of the, it, dude, the emotional highs and lows I've gone through here, to just come back to right where I was before, and I said, so you're telling me if I go into the store, I can just get the back, the back glass replaced for $39? He's like, oh yeah, that'd be a great option for you. I'm like, yeah, that'd be a great option for me. This is why I don't read listener mail. And so he says, you want me to cancel the express replacement? I said, yeah, I want you to cancel the express replacement. So I'm back right where I started. I gotta find time to go to the store, <sighs> hand it off, be without my phone for an afternoon or a day, who knows? But for $39 as opposed to $129. So they almost had me. To be but, clear, I do read listener mail, but this is why maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, maybe we don't, maybe they were, we shouldn't take listener advice. They were trying though. They, they, they did help us know about something we didn't know, yeah. but then in the long run, we got even more bamboozled than we were originally right. bamboozled. Right, and, and the guy on the phone seemed to suggest like, that's only true for some models. Like if I had a different model of phone, let's say a 13 Pro Max, they There's only have, one I more know, model. I know, I know. So that's, that's still wrong. That was wrong previously, was almost not wrong, and now remains to be still wrong for me. What's crazy is that that chat experience at Apple was uh, brought to you by Ocean <laughs> Breeze. Crave the wave. <laughs> hey, thanks as always for your time, attention, and trust. We'll talk to you next week. Ooh, September reservations for Which restaurant I saw Pearl that. I saw that. <laughs> Juicy berries, sunflowers, armfuls of fragrant herbs, and a balmy breeze. Yeah. Something to consider. Yeah. Next week, we're going to do an interview.